Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Oh, there's now. <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, not that your questions were. No, no. <laughs> no, but I, I asked them and they didn't do it, so I wanted to warm up the crowd. Okay. <laughs> My daughter has a um, two. My daughter has a two-year-old uh, Rocky Mountain that she's been starting using a lot of natural horsemanship under Charlie Anderson's guidance. And I'm just wondering if there's anything different about a gated horse or if you just bring up the same one. No, there really is nothing uh, different about them because especially when you're starting them, the biggest thing is, is you're trying to get them confident that all the things that you do with them that you don't mean them any harm and it might seem just like no big deal to you just to throw a saddle blanket on one but to the horse if he's never had it done before he might think that's about the strangest thing he's ever seen and and you know you figure that a horse that his only chance of surviving is to make a good decision to run away before he loses his life and he could uh, make a bad decision and just leave a little bit too late. And in nature, he'd lose his life. So the fact that they might be suspicious or afraid, that's perfectly normal. You'd like him to get over that. But as far as starting those kind of horses, you wouldn't do any different. You know, you're, you've got to get them to where they feel like they can trust you and that they're not bothered by you. Because without that, it's, it's not possible for the horse to learn. He may do some things right, but if he if he's not learning in an environment where he's real relaxed, it won't carry from one day to the next or one week to the next. You'll feel like you're starting over every day. And you're not making progress until something you did today carries over to tomorrow. Then you can start to accumulate some, some progress with the horse. Question. It's an honor to meet you. I'm Thank here you. with my two daughters, Bernadette and Samantha, and they both ride horses. This is their trainer, a boss, instructor. Um, I found it really interesting when you talked about uh, bringing some cows in with training. They both ride dressage and show through 4-H. How can we train that way if we don't have access to cows. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, really and truly what, what happens a lot in the showing deal is that we can get so focused on one thing that the horse becomes so one-dimensional that if you do anything to take him sort of out, as in, out of his environment that he's used to, and that can happen at a show because just the least little bitty thing that's not the same pattern that he's used to at home and what was going beautifully at home doesn't happen at the show anymore. So if it wasn't a cow, there are a million things you can expose him to that no, you don't have to necessarily do that at the show. But the more you can do with the horse to get him solid and where he's comfortable, where he relies on you, the better it is. So you just want to not get too stuck in just a pattern of what you've got to do to win a ribbon at a horse show and try to show them as much of the world as you can because it's the horses that win at the shows it's it's the one that acts the most grown up the one that's the most solid that that doesn't get rattled doesn't get bothered because if he's not rattled or troubled then the things that you were trying to get him to do at home to be ready for the show that'll surface he'll do that Whereas if he's bothered, all the things that you thought you had down the path, you'll swear you'd never done it on him. <laughs> okay, let's have somebody way in back. You'll have to shout. Okay, that, that nice lady all the way in the back row. Oh. Hey, please stand. Uh, the question was, um, how it, is, her, is his relationship with his brother considering the younger one? Is that your question? I think we got it. Uh, as 
as far as my brother goes, he, uh, he joined the Coast Guard right out of high school and spent 25 years in the Coast Guard, got married and raised a family, and uh, he lives in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and uh, he, uh, he's, had a, he's had a good life. May not, uh, he may not have uh, healed up in the same way that I did, but nevertheless, if, if, you, uh, if you asked him, he'd say he was pretty content. So it worked out okay for him. As far as my dad, it's a bit of a story. I, I won't be too wordy with it, but, but I, it's important because, you know, there's so much that every one of us here is humans probably could stand to hear a little bit more about forgiveness, you know. And uh, I got to be about a junior in high school, and, and, I, and I'm sure that because of the influence of <laughs> Betsy, my mom, that I, I had been thinking quite a bit about forgiveness, because you can see how she is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I, I knew my dad was getting older. He was 52 when I was born, so I knew he was getting older, and, and odds are he wasn't going to be around too long. And I just didn't want to have my dad die and think that, that I hated him and have him take that to the grave because it was something that I would have to carry around with me the rest of my life. So I wrote him a letter, and I told him that, that I forgave him for what he'd done to us kids, and uh, that I loved him because he was my father, and uh, I had no hard feelings. And he was, uh, he was really relieved to get a letter like that, and, and he wrote me back, and I saw him a handful of times over the years, because at the time I was rodeo and doing road tricks, performing all over the United States, so I got through Arizona a few times and I saw him, and frankly at that point there was really nothing that he gave back to me that I needed. I didn't do that for me. I, I just didn't want to see a, what was really kind of a pitiful old man die a more miserable death because he thought that I hated him. So I got rid of that, so that was good for me. And. Uh, and he died with a sense of contentment. As far as he knew, everything was completely cool between me and him. So uh, it sort of served its purpose. You know, a lot of people who are that way and make those kind of mistakes in their life, uh, they, they can act like nothing ever happened. And he was kind of that way. And a lot of people who are alcoholics, and, but there are people who act like alcoholics that don't drink at all. <laughs> And they'll do horrible things to other people, and their way of dealing with it, even though if they know it's wrong, they just act like it didn't happen. Well, it happened. And it was real, but uh, I felt like just getting rid of that was a real weight off my shoulders, and, and I moved on, and I tried not to look back. Let's go to the middle. Yes. And a lot of what you do, I see in the movies with young horses. And this horse probably spent 10 years in the show world. Um, probably um, not a good thing for it. And then went to a person who um, just trail rode it and spoiled it rotten. And so he's beautiful. I mean, to ride, he's nice. He's very pushy. He um, pushes the pressure. He doesn't get soft. Have you been successful to go back and try and fill in those gaps? I'm, I'm trying to get back to just getting him soft and working on that. Have you been successful doing that with an older horse? Yeah, absolutely. But what you want to think of is, you know, you might, you'd maybe see me working with a horse and you'd think, oh my gosh, I see all the things that this horse should be that he should have been a long time ago. Don't, you just don't want to try to get it all at once. You'll, you know, if you sort of lower your expectations if he's 18 years old compared to what you'd have with a two-year-old, but at the same rate, uh, don't settle for him just being the way he is because there's probably some things in there maybe that you haven't even seen yet that if you didn't try to improve him, 
could get you in trouble and could get him in trouble. But be prepared for him to progress slowly. But sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes a, an old fellow like that, maybe he's been waiting around his whole life for a good hand. And uh, you, it may surprise you, the progress. But it's only going to make your relationship better with him. So just kind of start easy and kind of, in a way, even though you could ride him just the way he is, act like he's a cult that's never been started and go through those basics and whatever is even maybe acceptable riding him is going to be a whole lot better if you get some of those fundamentals. So. Okay, one more question. Uh, no, well, let's have somebody on that side. Anybody? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, Stand, please. <laughs> Try to say it loudly. I feel like back to school. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> so, uh, in a lot of documentaries, the subject kind of takes over and starts telling its own story. Um, I was curious, you know, for, for both of you, is, is what, we, what we're seeing now, is this a lot of what you expected to start with? Did the story change as it went along? Cindy, why don't you get that first, and then Buck? Well, you know, we, we filmed for two and a half years. We had 300 hours of footage. Um, a lot of times, because you had three cameras on the same clinic. Uh, and I think that, you know, y'all have been to his, a lot of you have been to his clinics. I wanted to capture the feeling that you get at his clinics and the feeling that you leave with at his clinics and what's more powerful is, and I think you're all going to find this, that even when you leave this film, you know, and you go off into your daily life, there's going to be this little infiltration into your life of buckisms and what would Buck do? And, you know, my child is really acting out and what would Buck do? You know? So, and that's what I wanted to really capture in the film, and that's why we worked for two and a half years to get it. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't, didn't come easy. It, it was hard won. And, and I think that we did achieve it because, because you know, in the audiences that we have seen thus far, and we have seen quite a few audiences, um, it's amazing how many people want to see it again and again. And, and I see people for the third time come into a, a screening. They've been in some other state, and here they are. And I'm like, what are you doing here? And they're like, I, just, I have to see it again. Like, it, I'm crying, and I don't know why. You know, things like that. And I think that. That, yeah, if you have been around Buck, you understand that. Uh, there's little life lessons that just somehow come up, even when you least expect it. And, and that's what we were trying to achieve, and, and I hope that's what we did achieve. Well, I, I think for me, when we started this process, <clears throat> doing this, I told Cindy, I said, first of all, my, my priority is that I stay loyal to the people that came to the dance with me when the music started. And I'm not going to compromise how I do my clinics for the sake of doing a documentary. So because of that, she had to learn how to position the cameras and get the shots as if she wasn't there. Because I wasn't going to set things up so it worked perfect for her and so that me helping a lot of you that it was imperfect. What was it like? I know you were working with a Bob Redford on the film, but having a film made about you, how did that feel? <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> But, you know, this is, uh, it's, tonight, it's kind of what I expected, because there is a ton of you out there that I know. That, uh, and, uh, you know, I expected you to be here, because you guys have been kind of part of my life for a long time, and you've, you've known me way back, some of you back to the beginning when I could hardly get arrested. <laughs> and, uh, and I love you guys, and I appreciate you a lot. Okay, now let's turn it over for Q&A. Don't be shy. All right, I'll ask another question. How was it working with Cindy? 
You know, I had some, over the years there were people that asked me to do uh, documentaries before and I, I really always said, go right ahead and do a documentary, just leave me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I never was very interested in that. And, but Cindy and I had known each other and, and had been friends and so I trusted that she would, would do me right by this and do the best she could. And, and uh, I never really doubted for a minute that she would do a good job. And, and then looking back, you know, if you think about it, I mean, if, if any of you were in my position, it's a bit of a gamble having someone put on film your entire life, you know. When, <laughs> when you know, I've spent my whole life trying to, to do some good for horses and people. And even, you know, there's a possibility that a person could do the best they could. and completely misrepresent what you've tried to get across all these years, but uh, she didn't let me down. <laughs> of course, I didn't tell him I'd never made a documentary when I asked him. <laughs> well, I, I want to ask you, Cindy, what gave you the courage to do this as your first documentary because uh, it was so professional, and uh, in my field, I've seen thousands of documentaries and it's one of the most professionally produced and directed documentaries I think I've seen in a long time. Where did you pick up these skills? I'm not talking about a horsewoman now. It, 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 was, it was hard earned, let me tell you. I, I did surround myself with other documentarians that had done it before, clearly. Um, I had this desire and the passion and the idea from from thinking that this was an amazing story and how could it fail, but uh, I did need, I needed help, certainly, and, and I had a great group of, of women that helped me to pull that off. And what do you propose to do with this film now? Well, we're going to open, um, Buck is going to be in L.A. on the 17th, I'm going to be in New York on the 17th. It's opening in theaters uh, the next weekend, the 24th. It rolls out to a lot of major cities. July 1st, it rolls out to more. We're in over 100 theaters right now. Uh, Sundance Selects IFC has has done an amazing job in promoting this film, and the response has been overwhelming. Facebook, if y'all would please all go on Facebook and like us, because my goal is to reach 20,000 likes by the time we open, and. And IFC can't believe that we're up at 12,000 right now. And I'm like, you haven't seen anything. So, you know, we're, if you can, and also you can chat about it because it's amazing what people are saying on Facebook. I had never been on Facebook before, but it's really amazing how the chatter and the buzz, and people are forming little clubs and groups to go to the theater. And it's going to be here in Seattle at the landmark. Harvard exit on the, on the 24th. So tell your friends that live around here. So, you know, you know I'd be honest with you, I don't know anything about Facebook because I hardly answer phone calls. But, <laughs> <laughs> that is true. but, you know, it's, I'll say this that, you know, my clinics when I first started, uh, you know, it's true what Tina said in the documentary that. I used to have to haul people in my horse trailer to come to my clinic so that someone was there other than me. And uh, that wasn't one of my prouder moments. But, but over the years, this, this horse thing for me has spread by word of mouth. I've never spent a dime advertising, and I've, I've never tried to be a rock star doing this. I've just, just tried to help horses and people all these years, and, and a lot of you are really responsible for that, that had known me so long, it really just spread by word of mouth from one little clinic that started in Montana, and uh, now, gee, I'm, I go everywhere doing it, and, and it was just because of the people that cared about horses as much as I did, so, um, and that's kind of how this documentary has gone, because it's going to have a, maybe a real broad appeal and a, on a bigger scale than what I could ever do in my life, although, you know, I'm 29 years into this, doing clinics, and uh, everything goes all right for me. And uh, God sees fit to leave me here a little longer, I might get another 29 in for all <laughs> Now, Buck, uh, there was a very poignant scene in the uh, film uh, 
in which the woman broke down after you had discussed with her um, about the way she uh, treated the horse and that was a horse was a reflection of her and then you uh, said that you could always tell uh, by looking at the horse and the person how that person uh, was in, in <coughs> private. How did you come to that, that position in your life where you could feel the person and how they are th through their dealings with the horse? Well, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this because a lot of you have kids. You can look at someone, how they interact with their kids without saying anything and know quite a bit about the parent, just in how the kids are. And it's not so different with the horses. And, I mean, years of observation of people and horses, thousands and thousands of people and their horses, uh, you can hone in pretty quick on some things that that you can identify with the person what 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 got them to that point in their relationship with the horse. And, you know, it's not like that information would ever be something that you would use for anything but good, but it, it gives you a, an idea how you might be able to help somebody. 